I too want to mention how much we rejoice in Emil's obedience to the gospel this past Wednesday. And we hope that you'll get to know him and give him good support as a new brother in Christ. And it is Emil. <laughs> so let's keep that in mind. We live in a time that is permeated. I guess that's the best way to put it. We could say through and through, but that's what permeated means. Permeated with a terrible lack of respect. The exercise of propriety, if anybody knows what that means. Honor and reverence for anything or anybody. There's always been that kind of thing, but the age in which we live has just about made everything common and even worse than common, vulgar. Now, I know the word vulgar many times today means something like foul language, but the old original meaning of vulgar meant very low and common, which by its very nature means that there are some things people who speak English have tried to refer to in a way that was not common, thus making a distinction between that which is higher than other things and that which is more honorable and do more respect than some things. In the midst of all of this, God and sacred matters have not escaped being made common in the minds of mankind. God's mocked and ridiculed on every hand. Those who faithfully serve him, that is, serve him according to his will in the Bible, are also made light of and many times mocked. Thus men do not hold God in high reverence. And to put it bluntly and simply, they sin in so doing. They transgress God's will, 1 John 3 and verse 4, when they put God in a low plane and think of him sort of as a good old buddy that you can pretty well work and use any way you want to. But, of course, the saints of the living God and all that the word saint means, those set apart by belief and obedience to the gospel to faithfully serve God, <clears throat> should not be that way. In most cases, we certainly don't want to be that way. Thus, in this sermon, we desire to examine our own selves regarding our disposition of mind, regarding our mindset, our attitude toward God in general, and our conduct, now please get this, our conduct, our actions in the assemblies of the saints that are convened to worship him. The psalmist declared, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Psalm 89, 7. That's the King James Version. The American Standard Version, 1901, reads, A God very terrible in the counsel of the Holy Ones, and to be feared above all them that are round about Him. Let's study this just for a moment, because when we study this passage, and if you are reading the Bible like you should be reading it, like you ought to, then you'll see there are a multiplicity of Scriptures that echo the sentiments of the psalmist here. Written for your learning and my learning relative to our assemblies such as this and our worship of God. First of all, I call your attention to where it says God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. The word fear comes from a Hebrew word, aratz. It means to tremble. It means dread, it means fear, oppress, prevail, break, be terrified, and cause to tremble. It also means to regard or treat with awe, regard or treat as awful. I must stop here and say we don't use awful here the way we use it many times a day. That stuff tastes awful. 
Because the way that it's used here, awful, means full of all on my part toward God because He's God and I am who I am. But you see, modern day definitions sometimes don't fit what the Bible definition is. So we need to understand what's being said by the psalmist because it's written to guide you and to guide me. In the King James Version, this word's translated 15 times as afraid, fear, dread, terribly, break, affrighted, oppressed, prevail, or terrified. I would like to read what Charles Spurgeon had to say on this in his commentary, Psalms of David, on this very verse, Psalm 89, 7. So I read from Spurgeon, and he said in his comments, the holiest tremble in the presence of the thrice holy one. Their familiarity is seasoned with the profoundest awe. Perfect love cast out the fear which hath torment and works in lieu thereof that other fear which is akin to joy unutterable. How reverent should our worship be. Where angels veil their faces, men should surely bow in lowliest fashion. Sin is akin to presumptuous boldness. But holiness is sister to holy fear and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. As he quotes the psalmist again. The nearer they are, the more they adore. If mere creatures are struck with awe, the courtiers and favorites of heaven must be yet more reverent in the presence of the great king. God's children are those who most earnestly pray, hallowed be thy name. Irreverence is rebellion. Thoughts of the covenant of grace tend to create a deeper awe of God. They draw us closer to Him. And the more of His glories are seen by us in that nearer access, the more humbly we prostrate ourselves before His majesty. If you want to see this even described further in a bit of a lengthy reading from the Scriptures, I suggest you turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. Now the first three chapters introduce us to the book and then cover the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches of Asia. And in coming into chapter 4, the imagery and the figurativism is tremendous. And yet the message it sends to us concerning the glory and majesty and the holiness of God is amazing. You know, when Jesus gave the model prayer, he said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, let's look at the portrait drawn in colorful figurative language that the Holy Spirit gave the great Apostle John long, long ago in the last book of the Bible as he presents to us the mighty and glorious court of heaven itself. Remember what we said about awe and the proper definition of being full of awe or awful or amazing or how it is that these things are so much higher than we are? You keep that in mind when you read this. John writes, After this, that is what we mentioned in the first three chapters, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Didn't say it was a trumpet. It was like a trumpet, as it were. Which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on that throne. You will never hear him describe the one on the throne as if you might be describing some person you saw to your wife or husband or somebody else, trying to describe facial and so forth features. But listen how he does it. 
And look what you come away with when he finishes it. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And I simply add this here, seven means complete, thus this is the Holy Spirit. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts or living creatures full of eyes before and behind. They're all seeing. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the faces of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. We won't go into all the interpretation of that, but we could, but not now. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast thy crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Now, can you, can you just imagine a cell phone going off about this time in heaven? Can you imagine these folks in the great heavenly figure, and that's what it is, not being prepared to take the necessary precautions to come before God in the midst of all this? I saw, and I think it's still on YouTube, a concert violinist playing in a secluded atmosphere that reflected upon the nature of the very melody he was playing. And it was so beautiful. And he's in tune with it and right in the middle of it. And he kind of smiles and he just takes up the tune of the thing and just keeps playing the very tune that the song was. Of course, that's the way he worked it all out. We live in the irreverent age. Well, I didn't mean to do that. You didn't mean to do it. Shut the thing off and leave it at home. Well, well, and I might need to be... There's not a thing in the world in the presence of Jehovah God Almighty that His saints are to be doing in that presence that can't wait. Well, somebody might die. What are you going to do about it if you do find out about it? Well, somebody gets sick. We're going to talk more about that later. I just wanted to say that right after reading this beautiful, figurative, inspired account of the majesty and glory of heaven after we have read Psalm 87. Again now I read it. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in the reverence of all them that are about him. Now that's in heaven, but Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. We have the direction of the Holy Spirit concerning how we, the children of the living God, are to worship and the disposition of heart that ought to be there. You'll say more about what I just said earlier, but you get the drift very plainly. One of the greatest privileges, beloved, and blessings, that God bestows upon His people is that of approaching Him through the avenue of worship according to His will, and He knows, we know, that He hears us and He accepts our worship because we belong to Him. From the heart, we've obeyed the gospel, His power to save us, and we live our days doing as He's authorized. Thus, when we come before Him in worship, surely our minds should be singular in this joint participation of worshiping God according to His will. Jesus said, God is spirit. Literally in the Greek, God is spirit. It says God is a spirit here. But God is spirit. He is the spirit of spirits. There is no other than God. Now listen. And they that worship him, look at that next word, must emphasize that. Imperative. 
If your worship is acceptable to him, it must be worship that is in spirit and in truth. John 4 and verse 24. Now, I won't emphasize a lot about the truth here except to say we must operate according to the truth as it's revealed in the scriptures. We must do what he authorizes us to do. But what I will talk about here is the disposition of mind and attitude that we have as we do those things, exercise that truth, and I worship to him. And thus, worship in spirit is a must as well as worship God in truth. You can go through the motions and every act, but if your heart's not in it directed toward God as you offer these praises to God, this worship to God, then, then it won't be acceptable. So it takes the right disposition of mind as well as the right action. Worship is translated most of the time from the Greek word proskuneo. And it means to make obeisance, do reverence to, is used as an act of homage or reverence to God. I simply call your attention back to the description of Revelation 4. And that's as great a commentary as you'll ever see on what it means to worship God. Engaging acts of homage to God then requires all worshipers have a mindset, an attitude of respect and of reverence. That I must exercise. I must learn what those things mean. And I must know what it means in my life, in my conduct as I engage in whatever the truth requires of me in the acts of worship. Thus, we must always reverence God when we assemble to worship Him. One of the things that's happened in the Lord's church over the years is that people have got the idea that the worship assemblies to make me happy. It's to do things like I want it done. We'll go back and read Revelation 4 and everything concentrates around he who sits upon the throne. Everything has to do with pointing toward him. And everything we do in such a worship assembly here is designed to show him according to his will how much we love him and adore him and how we're his children and he is God, the great I am. Christians need to be aware that there are ways in which one may show then an irreverent or disrespectful attitude toward God. And do you think he takes it lightly? Look at all the passages you've got in both the Old and New Testament that shows that one does not just flippantly approach God as if you're going down to visit old Uncle Snort on the corner. It's not that way. So we need to know some of the ways in which one may show a lack of reverence toward God in worship that we'll know better how it is that we show proper scriptural reverence toward him in worship. We don't want to be guilty of that sin any more than any other sin because sin's the only thing that will separate us from God. The only thing. Nothing else will. And as his children, surely our desire is not to engage in some sort of false, irreverent worship and thereby sin. Let me just uh, put this bluntly and explain myself. One of the ways that we show our lack of reverence toward God in worship is to go to sleep. Just to go to sleep. Now, we certainly understand, and I want this clarifying, that there are those who, due to problems physically, even mentally, medication, um, whatever along that line, they become drowsy or whatever. I understand that. Everybody should understand that. In every congregation I've been in, I've seen people who, due to physical problems, simply couldn't hold their head up or they had special problems. We understand that. So dismiss that. I'm talking about what you in your life can control. That's what I'm talking about. So if I'm on medication or have some problem like that, I'm not talking to you. So what is the solution when people just go to sleep? Uh... I want you to listen to this. I had to go to school to learn a doctor's degree to understand that. Go to bed at a decent hour on Saturday night. Isn't that amazing? Do you think we ought to prepare for worship? Do you think it is obligatory upon us to prepare to come together on the first day of the week in this assembly to worship? Do you think that preparation then involves staying alert? Can you imagine being in, the, in such a state of affairs as read in, in, in chapter 4 and anybody going to sleep? 
I do know that when the Lord was struggling in the garden, I didn't know he was going to sing that song, or rather read the passage. I do know that when he was struggling in the garden, or, or, or Christ was struggling in the garden and praying, he asked what? When he found them asleep, couldn't you, couldn't you wait with me? And of course the impact on them, probably like this, was going to be on some other folks. They went right back to sleep as soon as he walked away. So go to bed at a decent hour on Saturday night. Young people, go to bed on Saturday night. You've got to worship God. And it's not a got to. You want to, don't you? Go to bed. Get some rest. I have stood in this auditorium, and there's nothing wrong with what I've heard people say. On Wednesday night especially, got to get home, get in bed, got a big day tomorrow, got to get the kids home. What about Saturday night? Got to get home, got to get to bed, we worship God tomorrow. Novel idea, isn't it, among the saints of the living God? <laughs> Yeah, we sort of get warped a little bit, don't we? Go to bed at least now on Saturday night. Uh, well, the kids sometimes stay up and make them go to bed. That might be a novel idea, too, to make kids do anything. But uh, that doesn't need to be a novel idea. Make them go to bed. Church, don't plan things on Saturday night. Your big day's coming tomorrow. You can have fun any day. But on the first day of the week, worship. That's the day you do that. That alone, with all five acts of worship, is on this day in the Assembly of the Saints. We need to be awake on Sunday morning and be physically and mentally refreshed and be alert to worship. Now, one thing you want to do is be sure you're really alert because it may be a boring preacher who preaches too long and you've got to stay awake. So when you have such a poor preacher then you need to do all you can to help him out and stay away. I would have to tell this one time because I was preaching in Overcup, Arkansas, the place where I was preaching when Jody and I married. And I could see folks were sort of getting cross-eyed more than usual in the middle of the sermon, and I hadn't gone as long as I usually do. And I wanted to make a point, and this came out perfect. Now, I rarely do this, but I did that day. And when I made my point, I hit the side of the pulpit, and it sounded like a bass drum went off, only even more so. After the service, one of the elders came up to me. If I remember right, he said sort of out like this. He said he was laughing a little bit. He said, I probably got a skint place on top of my head. He said, about the time that, I, that you did that, I reached up felt something tickle on my head and I was going to get it off and when I came up my arm came between you and me and I didn't see when you came down and hit that thing and since I don't normally do it he said I just about scraped the top of my head by my fingernail well we don't want that kind of thing to happen to keep you awake but if it takes it you all scratch one another to keep each other awake we understand these things. And I make light of it sometimes to drive that point home. God is right here. And we're before Him for one reason and one reason only. To show our love, our appreciation, our adoration, our reverence, our respect for He who has done so much for us that which we could never do for ourselves. Being Habitually late for worship, underscore habitually, habitually late for worship is a, is a way that is not going to help anybody do what God said in worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Again, I have to say we understand that there are extenuating circumstances in which one may be detained. That's not what we're talking about, but we say it for emphasis. We're talking about what you have power over, what you can control. We're talking about your planning. I believe we can say, without fear of contradiction, that those who are habitually late are not habitually late for work, are not habitually late for a doctor's appointment or some other <clears throat> important function. Oh, why would we late as the saints of God and the children of God to come before our Heavenly Father that we might worship Him? Oh, it's only one day a week. And if the preacher preached a long, long time, it's not that long. How long do you sit in front of a television or on some bleachers somewhere and watch a ball game? 
And when you get through, you'll say, well, that wasn't that exciting this time as I hoped it would be, but you'll be back the next time. So when that one's over with, you'll say, that wasn't as exciting this time as I hope the next one will be. Now that is for your entertainment. Well, we entertain one another here, but not in the light flippant way. We entertain one another as we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. It's to the Lord, but it benefits us. The singing, that is, and the prayers we pray together. And the Lord's Supper we collectively participate in as each one of us communes with the Lord in observance of the Lord's Supper. And as we study the scriptures even now, or as we give of our means. So let's ask, what other appointment is as important as the appointment for children of the living God to assemble together on the first day of the week to worship God. Then there are those who are frequently entering and exiting the worship. I must say this again. I'm not talking about folks who have some sort of physical problem. But I know I can speak for every preacher that has been faithful and earnestly preached the gospel. When you have taught and when you plead and then we sing a song, the design of which is to focus people on their need to obey the gospel or be restored, somebody, there's an exodus going backward instead of forward. Well, yeah, but if they're really ready to obey the gospel, they'd do it anyway. Well, yes, but aren't I, am I not supposed to be encouraging people by where I am at the time? If you've got to go to the bathroom, fine, go to the bathroom. Uh, if you have to, but if you go to the bathroom earlier, stay put. Uh, doing the things that we do, we're to be together, brethren. Do you realize that? You, you can't worship God in song and speak to one another if you're somewhere where they can't hear you. The worship service, as we call it, the assembly of the worship's not over till it's over. It has a beginning. And it has an ending as far as the collective assembling together for the purpose of worshiping God. And thus, we need to be mindful of what we do. Where is our mind? If it's like we're at a PTA meeting or a basketball game, then we might trip in and out. But some people wouldn't leave that for sure for fear that they would miss something. This should be an exception. That is, our going in and out of the worship period rather than a rule. It hinders the worship of others. And what you do right now where you are can hinder somebody from listening to what I'm saying. Now you say, what about the little ones? Little ones have to learn. That may be too a novel idea, but little ones learn. You learn, I learn, hopefully they will learn. They don't learn what's right by being encouraged to do something else. They just don't. They are going to have to learn to sit in this assembly. Our brethren have at times just thrown in the towel. Say, let's put them off over here in the corner. And then we'll let them be as they ought to be. Get them out of our hands so then we can worship. You don't have any authority in God to do that. You have authority to teach them to be in this auditorium participating in the worship. Well, they're too little to learn. When are you going to start? You're going to wait till they're five? That's fun. That's fun. Just wait till the five teach me anything. Well, as one preacher said one time, when a child is old enough to get your attention, he's old enough for you to get his. Now, how old do they have to be before they want your attention? As soon as they're born. As soon as they're born. So, taking them where they are, and their ability to learn and receive and be guided, you raise them. You bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's part of learning to worship. It's part of learning to sit still. But kids don't like to sit still. They need to learn. Did you learn? That's a novel idea, too. Your children are actually able to learn anything? Or are they just a bunch of doofuses? If I were to tell you that, why, you would not think highly of me at all. But then look how we treat them. Well, they can't learn. No, no. They're challenged. You say dumber than a stump or retarded. Are they, is that what's wrong with your child? No. You would not like that. But we treat them as if they can't learn right now. So we give in. Train 
What, training is putting them through the motions to do what's right so they'll learn by the example and by the education and then putting them through the motions. How are you going to learn to be in here and be what God says you ought to be in here if you're always finding it easy going out? You know one thing a child will do? Now, I, I hate to really go through this. It's so obvious. He'll work you any way he can. What is one of the best things to get a little one to learn to get out of the boredom of sitting in here to get you to take him out. And they'll do anything in the world. They're not inhibited. They'll screech and yell, roll on the floor and jump up and down, do anything around them to get you to take them out. Unless you take them out and they learn when they go out, listen to me, that it's far more pleasant to be inside than outside. Oh, horror of horrors. You mean we would actually discipline somebody? Yes, even in this day and age, we could. Thus, this needs to be done. Are you going to train them to do what they shouldn't do? It's just that simple. So I hope I've emphasized that enough. So leaving the worship assembly should always be kept at a minimum. But then there's the talking and there's the passing notes. I never will forget one preacher telling me that when they were singing one time, the song had a pause in it, and the two ladies that were visiting toward the back didn't realize the pause was there, and out in the pause came, I use Crisco. <laughs> Things similar to that have happened. They'll continue to happen. Each worship assembly must be characterized by a spirit of reverence of what we're here for. We, we would do well to understand why we come together. Ask yourself that. Why are you here? Why do we have this? Well, to obey God. But yes, that involves our understanding of why we're here and what we want to do because we're saints of God. We're children of God. The assembly is not just a social gathering. I wish we understood that. It is the Lord's people gathering together in God's presence. Jesus has said to the apostles regarding their particular work where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But that can be pointed out that he surely is here in the midst of us and to be worshipped. And we're to do the worshiping. When things take place during worship, such as talking and giggling or writing and passing notes, it not only shows disrespect toward those around us who are trying to do what God said in worship, being him acceptably, but surely we realize it's showing disrespect to God himself. All worshipers should realize that there are appropriate times to have a friendly conversation but during the worship of God Almighty is not one of them. Then, of course, what Brother Ken touched on earlier. Modern technology is wonderful. It's going so fast that, I don't know, somebody, might have been Buddy that sent it out here recently, something talking about the older person having all the gadgets that his uh, kids gave him and never could figure out how to use any of it, all this kind of thing. Uh, be that as it may, modern technology overall has introduced others to, to great things that we have, but it also can be abused and used at the wrong time, such as in the worship. Cell phones, iPads, Ken gave a list of them, uh, Kindles and Blackberries. What would you think if somebody just brought in Gone with the Wind novel and sat there and read it during the worship? What would you think if somebody came in and said, well, I've got this due in the morning at work, and I'll just sit down and prepare it right here during the worship? Well, what's the difference in that in texting, talking, or whatever else you can do, uh, turn, failing to turn the thing off and put it on vibrate? Now, you may, not, you may think this is just terrible, and I guess it is, but I don't think it was sinful. It sure made my point, and I never had a problem with it again. When I was teaching over in Austin, there were a couple of exceedingly brilliant students, and, and I knew they were brilliant because they knew they were brilliant, and they didn't mind telling me that. And they took a timer during the regular class periods of school and put it under the chair I was sitting in. And so you're up there to you, also the timer goes off. Bing, 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 bing. I said, okay, we've had our laugh, that's enough. Now these are preacher students, folks. 
I found out they're not any different than the rest. Uh, so here it is back. Well, guess what? It happened again. I said, enough's enough. Hey, back to them. Saw all these happy little victorious smiles on grown men in their early 20s. Students are students, no matter how old they are. So it happened a third time. I said nothing. I took that nice timer, put it on the floor, and stomped it till it would never work again. Said, here's your timer back. And the pride part about it was is that the fellow who put it took the timer, took the other fellow's timer and gave it to him, and he had to buy the other one a new one. And I simply said, I mean what I say. And I say what I mean. I can't do that here, and I wouldn't do that here. But that's a different story when you're teaching a bunch of preachers. Isn't that right, Jeff Litke? That's worse than teaching some up here in the, in, the, in the gated city in Huntsville. We entertain the children sometimes with these gadgets. Children learn to entertain themselves, these gadgets. We text friends or check for texting during worship. Again, I ask, would you read a library book during worship? Would you write a letter to somebody during worship? Well, it has been done. Will we play a board game during worship? Can you see somebody sitting over here and they're playing checkers? Well, what's the difference when you got your little electronic checker game going on right here, right during worship? What's the difference? Not any at all. And so it's amazing that real good things are so helpful and expedient, but by a wrong attitude toward them and not knowing when to use them, they become detrimental to ourselves and they bring about sin. These are some of the things that ought to cause us to reflect on everything we do in this worship assembly. I hope that I've made myself clear. I hope all of us, yours included, will be mindful of our conduct and disposition of heart and our worship. And if you don't have any electronic whatevers, if you don't write any notes, you can still let your mind drift. Thus, you ought to be thinking about every act of worship and what it means, to whom it's directed, and the thanksgiving that ought to be in our hearts. I found out that concentration a long time ago helps a lot in keeping your mind where it ought to be. I've said in situations to where the man that was doing the speaking had more knowledge than I ever will have, but the way he delivered it, it was as dry as it could be, but I learned to listen to the information presented rather than the way it was presented. And I learned a lot, and I still cherish that man that had him as a teacher. So when we are here together, we're here together for a reason, to worship God. And to have the right respect so that we won't disrespect him must mean we're full of fear in the proper way of all as we come before God. God's here as much as you are, and he's here to hear us praise him and thank him and to engage in these acts of worship to show our love for him. Let us then help each other. Let us be mindful of that when it comes to rearing our children, teaching them and training them how they should be in the service, and let us all help each other to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. If you're not a Christian today, we urge you to become one because you're still lost in your sins if you're not a Christian. To believe in Christ on the basis of the teaching of the Bible, Romans 10, 17, to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, confess your faith in the Christ, the Son of God, and then complete your obedience to the gospel and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. As a child of God, have you committed sin? Sin is public, brought reproach on the church. If you have, we urge you to be humble and receive with meekness the engrafted word and repent, confess those sins, pray God for forgiveness. Let us all unite together in service to he who loved us and gave his life for us. If you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.